This is Mark Breederland with the Michigan Sea Grant Program. I'm based in Traverse City, Michigan, and I serve uh, as the Michigan Sea Grant representative on the Great Lakes Sea Grant Crude Oil Transport Team. That's uh, programs from the Sea Grants from Minnesota Sea Grant all the way out to New York and Vermont uh, and our uh, colleagues out at Lake Champlain Sea Grant. Welcome to our second webinar of 2019 hosted by our Sea Grant Network Crude Oil Transport Network. Our first webinar was held last month with Dr. Guy Meadows from Michigan Technological University and is available on our website with captioning. The Crude Oil Transport webinar series is meant to provide the latest research and resources to stakeholders in the region to inform decision-making around this complicated and complex issue. Anyone with a vested interest in how crude oil and associated products move through the region will find the content informative. Let me give you a few logistics for today. First, the webinar is being recorded and will be available as the last month's was on our crude oil transport website, which is on your screen. That's glslcrudeoiltransport.org for Great Lakes St. Lawrence. Uh, second logistic is that you are invited to submit questions through the question and answer uh, chat box. It should be on the right of your screen when you uh, find that there. There will be question and answer time at the end of the talk, but we'll be sure to wrap up by three o'clock at the uh, latest Eastern time. Uh, one more note while I have uh, everybody's attention, our third webinar is going to be held August 19th, same time, with Mr. Bill Hazel the Vice President of Marine Services from Marine Pollution Control Incorporated. I hope you can enjoy join us as well for that uh, seminar. I think those are all my logistics, and it is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Mr. Stephen Keck. Stephen Keck serves as the Chief of Emergency Management and Force Readiness for Sector Sault Ste. Marie of the U.S. Coast Guard. Steve has served in his position with the Coast Guard since 2010, but he has an additional 24 years of active military duty with the U.S. Air Force in a variety of positions. He has an earned Master of Science degree in Homeland Security, and he's proudly a Michigander, hailing from Petoskey, Michigan. Steve's responsibilities include, one, coordinating with maritime stakeholders to identify and mitigate hazards, enhance preparedness and strengthen emergency responses, and two, his responsibilities regard reco uh, recovery capabilities in the sector's area of responsibility for contingencies, lots of contingencies, marine security incidents, hazard material spills, continuity of operations, mass rescue operations, and active shooter mitigation. So Steve supervises multiple contingency offices to include port security, emergency management, small boat readiness, and reserve force readiness. Steve is here today to tell us about oil spill response exercises and planning. Steve, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, good, I, I hope you can hear me, uh, everybody. Um, Sounds good. Good, great. Uh, thanks for the introduction, I appreciate it. And again, thanks for uh, the, the invitation. So I'm going to kick this thing uh, right off by going to a document that I think a lot of you are probably familiar with. It's the potential ecological impacts of crude oil transport in the Great Lakes Basin, which was prepared by the Great Lakes Science Advisory Board of October 2018. The reason I cite that reference in page four there, it states that uh, the ongoing transport of crude oil has highlighted the need to better understand potential threats to regional aquatic ecosystems and the region's preparedness to respond to spills. So, and that's what I'm here to talk about today, our, our ability to respond to spills. So if we could please go to the next slide, the overview slide. I'm gonna kind of breeze through the, the first couple topics there. I'm gonna talk about uh, our area of responsibility, Sector SUS, just so everybody has a clear understanding of, of what our captain is responsible for up here. Uh, talk about the difference between the coastal zone and the inland zone, again, very briefly, just to set the background, and talk about the federal on-scene coordinator's role in a spill response. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about why we exercise, uh, particularly where we exercise, what we exercise, and when we do it, because there is a method to the madness, and I want to kind of explain that. And then we'll kind of look back at our last uh, nine or ten years of our exercise history, 
just to illustrate where we've been exercising, like I mentioned, and, and what we've been working on, what we're trying to achieve, more importantly. And then I'm really going to focus on the pipeline exercises and what we've learned from those, and I'll discuss uh, just not just the uh, soft water exercises, but our hard water or ice exercises as well, and the lessons learned that came out of that. Um, and then finally, what we've improved over the last 10 years and what challenges still exist for us out there. And then I'll answer the big question, are we ready? So, next slide, please. So what you're looking at right there is a picture of uh, Sector Sault St. Marie's captain of the port zone. And you can see that it goes basically from Alpena over to Traverse City, up uh, northern Lake Michigan, northern Lake Huron, Lake Superior. And then it goes all the way out to Minnesota, North Dakota border. Um, so it's a massive geographical area that we cover. All those small boat stations you see in there, like Station Marquette, St. Ignace, Charlevoix, for example, they all fall under Sector Sault Ste. Marie's command authority. Now, we do have Marine Safety Unit Duluth out west, which handles the western portion of that, but our captain can assume authority over Duluth. Uh, for example, he can submit one captain of the port order to cover the entire air responsibility if we had a, a spill or something that required him to do that. Um, in our area of responsibility, I think the three big target areas that everybody focuses on are obviously the Straits of Mackinac, um, the St. Mary's River, and then the third one I don't think is quite as obvious, but I, I'm going to talk about it later, and that's what, I, what we call the US-2 corridor. Um, it runs through our area. It runs from St. Ignace to roughly Manistique, and then it cuts up into the inland zone. It roughly runs along, like I said, US-2, and technically it's in the inland zone, which is the EPA's authority. However, uh, we've identified uh, at least 12 water crossings right there where we feel if the pipeline were to rupture, it would be in Lake Michigan. In some instances, and depending on the time of year, it could be in the lake within a matter of minutes. So uh, we're going to talk about that area as well. Uh, next slide, please. So for the U.S. Coast Guard, uh, the Federal On-Scene Coordinator um, for the Coastal Zone, that is Captain Patrick Nelson. He's our current commander. Uh, what is a federal on-scene co uh, coordinator? As you can see, they're the fish responsible for coordinating and directing the removal of oil discharges and hazardous substance releases. And the Coast Guard refers to this individual as the FOSC, federal on-scene coordinator. Um, and again, we have responsibility for the coastal zone. And I put a definition of what the coastal zone is there. I'm not going to read you the whole thing because it's pretty lengthy, but the first line kind of sums it all up. It means all U.S. waters subject to the tide, U.S. waters of the Great Lakes, specified ports and harbors uh, on inland rivers. Uh, that, that sums it up pretty well. Um, but again, if, if a spill does originate in the inland zone and finds itself in the coastal zone, uh, we'll work that out with the EPA, who has lead on that spill response. The question we get all the time when we talk about, the, uh, about spills, the question we get posed to us when we do outreach meetings, for example, uh, is, is who pays for the spill cleanup, and we always tell them that's, that's the responsible party, uh, takes care of spill cleanup. They're the ones that pay the contractors to get in and do it. And then the next question is, well, what if you don't know who's responsible? Or what if it's a mystery machine? Who's going to pay for it? Well, then it falls back to Open 90, the Oil Pollution Act of 1990, and the Oil Spill Liability Trust Fund uh, is, is what we leverage to pay for the spill response. So no matter who spills, it, it's going to get cleaned up. Uh, next slide, please. We are bound by what we call PREP guidelines. Um, this is what uh, drives our exercise uh, program. And it just stands for the National Preparedness and Response Exercise Program. And it was developed to establish a workable exercise program that meets the intent of the Oil Pollution Act in 1990. What's interesting about it, it doesn't mandate a given exercise design process. Uh, plan holders, as it says, are free to design their exercises um, to fit their own needs, uh, to, but they have to achieve their objectives. We at Sector SU um, use what we call HSEEP, which is the Homeland Security Exercise and Evaluation Program, to design our exercises. Um, and I guess the big question is, how many oil spill exercises do we do? Well, we're mandated to do a minimum of one, either discussion-based or an operational exercise per year. Uh, we go way above and beyond that by doing an additional two incident management team drills. Uh, a lot of those drills over the last couple of years have focused on ship groundings in the St. Mary's. Uh, I'd say that is our most common, most, most realistic scenario. We actually average about five ship groundings a year in the St. Mary's. We've been fortunate this year, knock on wood, uh, we haven't had any major groundings, uh, and that's primarily due to the water levels being up, which is a good thing for us. Uh, we also conduct quarterly prep notification drills, and then we have a directed number of what we call GUIs. It stands for Government Initiated Unannounced Exercises, and those are for our facilities. Um, and that's just what it says. They're unannounced, so we go out and do those as well. Now, we could have more 
exercises than that when it comes to oil spill exercises. There's been years in the past where we've had several where we've done oil and ice exercise and in the winter and then turned around and done our normal exercise in the summer. Uh, there are times we exercise the Candy Slack Plan, which is uh, Canada U.S. Lakes, which is an annex to the Joint Contingency Plan. So there are circumstances where we exercise uh, more than one major exercise. But uh, the guiding principle is the FOSC must exercise all the components of the area contingency plan during that four-year exercise cycle and address any gaps that are identified. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> what, are, what are we testing? Well, we're testing our Northern Michigan Area Contingency Plan when we do our exercises. And, uh, and then I also want to talk about the Northern Michigan Area Committee. Um, that's, again, we, that's what we're testing. We're testing that plan. And the National Contingency Plan mandates of the ACP must be adequate to remove a worst-case discharge. And this gets a lot of, of conversation, and, and, and I'll explain why. Uh, so it must address the worst-case discharge from a vessel onshore or offshore facility to include events from pipelines, rail, offshore facilities, and onshore facilities and vessels. So what is, what is a worst-case discharge? Well, according to the CFR, for a vessel that's a discharge in adverse weather conditions of its entire cargo, for uh, offshore on for, uh, onshore facility, that's the largest foreseeable discharge in adverse weather conditions. And here's where it gets sticky when you talk about pipelines. Uh, we don't regulate pipelines. The Coast Guard doesn't regulate them. PHMSA does, the Pipeline Hazardous Materials Safety Administration. So therefore, they determine the worst case discharge numbers. And, um, but we do exercise it, even though they regulate the pipelines because it passes through the coastal zone, we, we do pipeline exercises. And their worst case discharge numbers are, are what we're exercising. We have different numbers in our area contingency plan than PHMSA does uh, because we calculate that number differently. I'm sure Guy Meadows got into to volume out uh, last, uh, last webinar in great detail. Our numbers are, are different for a lot of different reasons. Um, but again, we're bound by 49 CFR. So when we talk about pipeline discharges, what we're talking about in the Straits of Mackinac we're talking about the complete loss of product in both 20-inch lines between St. Ignace and uh, Mackinac City. Um, and then we're taking into consideration a 10-minute identification time and a three-minute shutdown time to calculate our number for what we determine as a worst-case discharge, and that's what we have in our area contingency plan, and that's what we exercise, too. So who comes up with the exercises? Well, basically, it, it's not the Coast Guard in a, in, a, in, a, in a vacuum. It's the Northern Michigan Area Committee by consensus that decides where the greatest risks are and where we should place our exercise focus and what we should be exercising on. Um, and the Northern Michigan Area Committee, which is made up of our federal, state, local, tribal, and academia partners, as well as some members of uh, industry are involved in that as well. Um, they identified ship groundings in the St. Mary's as our greatest risk for a spill scenario. And like I said, we have about five of those a year on average. And then Enbridge Line 5 in the Straits of Mackinac was identified as the highest consequence spill scenario. So we, we, we rank those two, you know, both side by side. Um, the methodology that we use to determine that risk is risk equals what we call severity times probability times exposure. It's called the SPEE model. And that's how we calculated uh, what our greatest risks are. And I'm going to use this as, a, as an opportunity to put in a plug for the Northern Michigan Area Committee. I was talking to Mark before we kicked off the webinar. And uh, as I said, that's a committee made up of your federal, state, local, tribal, academia, uh, partners, and, and some industry folks. But when we do have a spill and we stand up our incident command post and, we, you know, we, we stand up the ICS structure, the people that are invited to, you know, sit in those seats, the people we're looking for are the people that are generally, you know, members of our area committee. Obviously, the Coast Guard's going to be involved at EPA and so forth. But this is a great opportunity for members of academia to get involved with the area committee. So if we know what you're researching, what you're working on, we can get that information built into our plans, uh, get you to the ICS training if you so desire. And when we have a spill, you know, the, obviously we're going to reach out to you if you're te te technical expertise. So that's my plug for the uh, Northern Michigan Area Committee. Um, the Northern Michigan Area uh, uh, Contingency Plan must be reviewed annually by the federal on-scene coordinator. And what he or she is looking for just basically they validate their contact information. They're looking for uh, make sure we put in there all of our lessons learned from our exercises. We're looking for a validation of those worst case discharge numbers uh, and, and identification of, of any gaps. So, <clears throat> and then now, like I said, that's reviewed annually by the FLC. And there's also a five year uh, review that's uh, review that's random. So, and that's a national review. Next slide, please. 
So here we go. All right. So we covered the background on that stuff, which a lot of you, again, I'm sorry if I bored the broader audience with a lot of that stuff. But again, I just wanted to lay the groundwork there. So looking at our, our 10 year exercise history here, what we've done up in the Sioux uh, throughout, when I say the Sioux, again, I'm talking about our entire AOR uh, that I just discussed. Um, going back to uh, uh, 2011, we started with the vessel exercise, and that was a canyon slack exercise here in the, in the St. Mary's. Now that, that document that I referenced earlier, the potential ecological, ecological impacts of crude oil transport in the Great Lakes Basin also states that we should look at all means of transport in our AOR and we think we're doing a good job of doing that. You kind of look at that, that nine year breakdown of exercise we've done and we did a, a vessel exercise in 2011, we did an aircraft out in Beaver Island in 2012 and that was a double up year because we also did an oil and ice in the Straits of Mackinac. Uh, then we did a tanker truck, which is a mobile facility in Sheboygan. Then we did another oil and ice in the Straits of Mackinac. Then we did a pipeline exercise in 2014, and that was an interesting exercise because uh, where we ran that exercise is right where Embridge Line 5 crosses right between Burt and Mullet Lake underneath Indian River. And I don't know if a lot of people are familiar with, with that, um, where the pipeline runs there. Um, and technically, that's the coastal zone because that's a navigable waterway. But that was a good exercise because what we did is we initially took charge as FOSC and then we uh, uh, turned over uh, OSC to the EPA once we identified that it was not going to get out to uh, Lake Huron. Um, but that was, a, that was a good exercise with EPA on that one. And then 2015, we were back in the Straits with a massive uh, exercise with Enbridge again in 2015. Technically a functional exercise, meaning a command post exercise for the Coast Guard side of it. But uh, Enbridge and the Coast Guard were also out uh, deploying equipment in the Straits. The difference is with a functional exercise with on-water deployment of, of assets is that um, it's not scenario driven. They were doing their own stuff and they were testing their Osro's capability to respond to a worst case discharge in the Straits. So they were exercising their uh, onshore, nearshore and offshore capabilities. Uh, and then they were running uh, a full joint information center. They did wildlife rehabilitation. Uh, they're kind of covering all the bases, uh, most of the core components of the PrEP guidelines in that exercise in 2015. I think all in all, we had about 700 people participating in that exercise. And then 2016, another pipeline exercise, this time out in Manistique, where the pipeline crosses under the Manistique River. And we kind of shifted gears and uh, moved away from the pipelines in the Straits for a while. Uh, went to a, a, a derailment of a train. Uh, we focused on that for a couple years out of Manistique, and this year we're shifting gears again, and uh, we're heading down to Rogers City, and we're working with the U.S. Oil for a, a facility exercise. So again, if you look at that, you've got rail facilities, pipelines, trucks, uh, vessels, aircraft. I think we I think we hit every mode of transportation, and and that's the kind of the mindset that we want to maintain. Um, I don't want to get into right now, uh, although it, coming from that same document talking about all modes of transportation, uh, about sinking oils, I'll let Bill Hazel talk about that. He's the expert on that. But I will talk about in situ burn in uh, a lot more detail when we move up, when we get to that slide. So, um, and I did mention I would talk about the US 2 corridor. You notice that Manasique exercise, that's part of that US 2 corridor. And uh, again, I'm going to talk more a little bit about the US, tour, US 2 corridor and what our concerns are there with the pipeline. So, um, let's go ahead and uh, take a look at the next uh, slide, please, and we'll talk about the pipeline exercises specifically. So we did five pipeline exercises in a five-year period. The 2012 and the 2013 exercise in the, uh, the oil and ice that we did in the Straits of Mackinac, on the next slide, I'm going to get into great detail about what we learned. That's a question we get all the time during outreach. What if we have a spill in ice conditions? And, of course, that was a concern of ours as well. Um, 2012, 2013, put a great deal of focus on that. Um, and I've got a lot to talk about when it comes to the lessons learned or responding in those conditions. Again, 2014, a full scale exercise in Indian River, like I mentioned before, uh, that was pipeline. And 2015, of course, I mentioned in the Straits. And then um, the uh, tabletop in Manistee. So, five and five years, a lot of focus on those exercises, and a lot of reason that we, we broke away from those. Uh, exercise in the Straits were due to uh, exercise fatigue on the local responders in uh, Mackinac um, because we also do security exercises there too and we're doing an, another four-year cycle of security exercise in the Straits for active shooter on a, on a, on a ferry. So again, we don't want to overstress one particular area. Um, and plus we want to get out to the other areas of the AOR that I mentioned and look at other modes of transportation as well. So next slide, please. 
Okay. So lessons learned, oil and ice, 2012 and 2013. And I would assume that some of you online or, or listening today were, were participated in these in these exercises. And these were these were big evolutions as well. Um, as I said, pretty much any time we do outreach, we get the questions, what if it happens in winter? And so that's what we wanted to find out too. So we worked with uh, Coast Guard Research and Development out of Connecticut, and we put on these these drills in the Straits of Mackinac. Um, there were some command post objectives we had there too, just focusing on the Coast Guard's ability to stand up their ICP and send command post and uh, establish their unified command and develop and maintain a common operating picture and develop their incident action plan, which are pretty much standard objectives in a full-scale exercise. But what we learned in the ICE uh, was more telling. Um, I'm going to go over some of the things that, that went well, and then I'll discuss some of the challenges that, we, that came out of the oil and ice exercises. Um, first, what went well? Uh, we were able, we're talking about in-situ burn, we were looking at it way back then. We were able to, de to uh, deploy and tow fire boom. Uh, however, we learned that any type of boom, uh, the boom must be extremely robust to operate in those conditions, those ice conditions, and it should be deployed and retrieved in open water. Um, there were some cases where the boom was deployed and it was uh, destroyed by the ice. Uh, I think a lot of people who aren't familiar with northern Michigan have the assumption that smooth as a, or ice is a nice, smooth, flat thing, and that's certainly not always the case. Uh, we also learned that uh, tugs were the best vessels um, for, for towing the boom. Um, the reason being is that uh, the tugs can go one to two knots, and they don't have to clutch in and out um, like the other vessels did to tow that boom, because what happens when you move too quickly is the product that's captured in the boom, uh, you get entrainment and you'll lose that product. And what we were doing in the Straits of Mackinac, we were using an oil surrogate. We were using uh, peat moss and oranges to represent the, uh, the oil. So that's what we were working on. Uh, the conditions uh, that we were working with the fire boom and we were towing it were roughly two to three foot seas and about 20 knot uh, winds. Pretty standard uh, for that time of year. Um, the first year we did it, it actually rained, I think, the first year. And then the next year we had something like you know 10 or 15 blow, which is more normal for February in the Straits. So we've, we've seen some pretty adverse weather there. Another thing that worked well, and uh, I hope Dr. Meadows is online, your ROVs and uh, AUVs uh, worked really well. Um, in general demonstration, they provided, uh, they showed great potential as an under ice sensor platform to locate oil concentrations under the sheet ice. And they were also potential a means of positioning and manipulating oil recovery equipment beneath the ice. However, the ones that we were testing uh, were, were a bit small. Um, so they didn't allow us to put complicated or sophisticated sensors on them. So we would have liked to have gone back out there with bigger AUVs and ROVs, uh, which would have provided a more stable platform and uh, to see how they work. And hopefully that kind of stuff is, is still yet to be seen uh, for some future exercises. We tested a oil detection system known as the rudder oil spill detection. It's a type of radar, ice detection radar. Um, uh, it worked far better than, than the normal radar on the ship in identifying areas of open water. Um, obviously, we couldn't put any actual oil out on, on, the, on the lakes, but again, it, it showed us a much uh, better picture um, than we were getting for normal radar. Um, as I, I wrote a thing here, so the oil spill detection and ice detection radar clearly displayed areas of open water as well as a variety of lake ices such as solid plate, rubble ice, uh, and features that were not discernible on the ship's navigational radar. Um, and we were able to see up to three nautical miles with that radar. So that was a, a definite win. We also focused on, I think there's actually a picture of it. Yeah, there is on the slide on the top, upper right there, of herding techniques. Again, we were using those oil surrogates, and we were able to use the ship's fire monitor to guide or direct the oil surrogate, again, which were frozen oranges and peat moss, into pockets formed by the cutter and between the cutter and the ice sheet. Um, the technique... Uh, when coupled with a bucket skimmer worked extremely well. Um, and the bucket skimmer also proved useful in moving sheets of ice away from the open water, or I mean clearing areas for open water for recovery. Uh, I think that the product I think they used was the Lemoore uh, Oil Recovery Bucket Skimmer. And I, I'm pretty almost 100% positive that's the actual product that Enbridge ended up buying after those exercises because it, it worked uh, so well for us there. Uh, other things that went well, we tested an aerostat balloon. Again, that's on that slide. That's the lower right. You kind of see it. Uh, you can see it in the picture there. 
It's a, it is what it says it is. It's, it's a balloon. It's a giant balloon. And it was equipped with remotely controlled optics and infrared real-time video cameras. And it provided uh, excellent situational awareness to the crews and the command post. So it could beam that information to handheld devices. It could beam it to the ships. It could beam it back to the command post. So we were all seeing the same thing. Um, UASs are, can also obviously be used for this role. And it's, the UASs are um, unmanned aerial systems, drones, if you want to call them that, are something we're incorporating into all of our exercises now. But I think the big advantage with this aerostat is we were able to launch this aerostat. I think we put it in an altitude around 700 feet, and we, we could leave it up there for days. Uh, whereas the UAS, obviously a drone is going to have uh, much shorter legs, isn't going to be able to stay up that long, uh, and could be hampered by uh, winds. Whereas the aerostat provided a really stable platform and gave us a great picture. Um, so that, that, that worked well. What didn't work so well? Um, certain skimmers did work well, such as the uh, Helix skimmer. Uh, however, some weren't robust enough to stand up to ice and the elements. Uh, we tested a road mop skimmer, for example, and that had uh, difficulty operating at high winds. If you're wondering what a rope mop skimmer is, it's exactly like the, the mop your mom had, uh, a, ro a rope mop, but in a much bigger scale. It, it worked okay, but... Uh, it, like I said, it had difficulty in the high winds, and it would freeze up. And uh, we also tested a groove drum skimmer, skimmer, which had issues with the steam line freezing overnight, and um, it had insufficient weight to displace the surrounding ice rubble. So with those skimmers, uh, they would have to be ruggedized uh, to make them more all-weather capable, and there's been a lot of work in that direction to do exactly that. The uh, work-rest cycle was an issue. Um, Crews typically could only work for about 15 minutes before having to come inside to warm up. Um, this could be overcome by surging the work crews, uh, doubling the crews, uh, keeping one crew out there at all time while the other one's in, in warming up. Um, we would have also liked to explore specialized clothing suited for the environment, which could also stay in contact with, with oil. That was something we were hoping to get to the, the, the third year. Um, and obviously something that it would be obviously important to have staged and pre-positioned and ready to go in the straits. It was also very challenging with loading equipment onto the barges due to the ice on the piers. The way it was working, we were bringing the uh, ships into uh, Station St. Ignis, into their pier, and then the equipment had been mobilized on uh, tractor trailers and then brought to St. Ignis and then mobilized and put on the ships. And, uh, you know, the, the pier was ice-covered. So obviously that created a huge issue, and we had to clear the pier of ice, and that slowed down the process getting the equipment aboard aboard the uh, vessels. Um, how this has been addressed is by pre-positioning the barges with the skimmers. Uh, Enbridge has placed barges and uh, those Lamar uh, bucket skimmers. They're co-located in Sheboygan and Escanaba, so they would just be mobilized there, placed on the barges, and then the tugs would take them to uh, the location of the spill. But, um, yeah, the ice on the, on the piers is definitely an issue. We tried to set up a mobile command post outside, and that simply blew away. So we found out that uh, very challenging environment to work in, but uh, we were able to overcome most of them. And then uh, just simply darkness. Um, that time of year in the Straits of Mackinac, by, you know, 5 o'clock, it's dark out there. Um, the weather is tough to deal with. Um, however, we have been assured that um, they – Certain uh, in industry folks assure us that they could uh, mount lights on the barges and that they could operate at night if need be. And, of course, that's always going to be a safety call. But a ton of lessons learned came out of the, uh, the oil and ice drills. And so what uh, we wanted to, we wish we could have tested um, more would be, uh, again, getting the AUVs and ROVs back out there, larger platforms to test more sensors, uh, more of that ruggedized equipment. Uh, we wanted to get that back out there, and that leads me to the next slide, please. We really wanted to take this test <laughs> one more time. Uh, we really wish we could have got a third year out of it. Um, however, uh, R&D simply didn't have the money available to go back to the Straits for a third year. Uh, had we had the funding, clearly we could have done that. And again, uh, I mentioned exercise fatigue in the local community because we knew we were coming back in 2015, back to the Straits for a massive full scale again. So there was a couple reasons we didn't go back for a third year into the Straits of Mackinac for an oil and ice drill. And uh, again, it's possible in the future we, we may see that again. But um, we weren't available. We weren't able to get out there for a third year. So then the question becomes, what uh, 
what's the point of these exercises? Next slide, please. Remedial action items uh, are what come out of the exercises. We, we always tell people as planners that uh, we don't go out, the Coast Guard doesn't go out, for example, and hold an exercise just to prove how good we are at something. Uh, it's quite, quite the opposite. We're, at, we're, looking, we're trying to identify gaps uh, in, in our plan, uh, our plans, our training, and our resources. We're trying to identify those apps, uh, gaps, and then we create what we call a remedial action item. Now, that's not an actual one um, from an oil spill, but it's just an example of what a remedial action item looks like. And basically what we do is we create a, a remedial action item. Uh, we entered into our uh, contingency preparedness system, CPS, and then basically we hope funding is available to address those gaps, those uh, gaps in the plans, the training, and the resources. And sometimes there's money, and sometimes there's not money. Um, so a lot of those remedial action items, I shouldn't say a lot, but some of those remedial action items can remain open for years and years um, waiting for funding to come along. Others, um, on the other hand, next slide, please, get addressed uh, relatively quickly. And these are some of the improvement areas that I'm talking about uh, where remedial action items um, have paid off for us. And this is where I said I wanted to talk um, a little bit about in-situ burn. Now, most of you are probably familiar that in-situ burning of oil in the Great Lakes or on the Great Lakes is not a pre-approved uh, tactic. Um, it has to have approval by the RRT, the regional response team, before we can burn. Um, so what we did is we created a work group uh, on in-situ burn with subject matter experts. And uh, the first thing we were trying to do was to streamline the process for approval because with in-situ burn, you have a limited amount of time that you can actually, uh, there's a window of opportunity to burn the product. And so we wanted to streamline that process as much as possible. So that we can, if we do decide to do in situ burn, that we can get to it in a timely fashion. Um, and a lot of other uh, issues that are hanging out there. Um, and, and again, I don't know if, if Bill Hazel plans to address these or not. Uh, he may. But um, questions we had of will the product ignite 24 hours after uh, the spill? Will it ignite 72 hours, 96 hours? We didn't know those answers necessarily because so little work has been done in an in situ burn in a freshwater environment. Um, also, uh, what about the water temperature itself? I mean, these are going to be extremely cold water temperatures. Will it ignite? And then what about the off product uh, from the burn, both uh, the product that's going to go into the water column and the product that's going to go into the atmosphere? So there was a lot of questions that are out there. So we've continued to work on in-situ burn, and Enbridge just briefed out um, the results of, of some of their controlled burns that they did. Uh, at the last area committee meeting, a very interesting presentation. Um, basically, uh, we found out, yeah, the, what's going through that pipeline will ignite. Uh, they were able to uh, ignite it after it had weathered um, for a substantial amount of time. And then we also found out that the, the winter uh, may actually be the best time to burn it because um, it won't, uh, it won't uh, evaporate as quickly. The product will remain there and it probably uh, will still ignite. Um, and we also found out that the ice serves as, as a type of fire boom. Quite frankly, if we can get into a pocket, we can use ice uh, and ignite it that way. So a lot of work still on that. And then we briefed that, I believe, at the end of September, the, um, uh, the DRAT, the District Response Advisory Team, briefed that they will be doing another burn. R&D is going to be leading research and development for the Coast Guard down in Mobile, Alabama, some more burns. And I think we'll be looking for some of those answers that I just brought up a second ago about the off products, what the results of that will be. So there are more burns in the future. So we've made a lot of progress on that. Um, and the reason we look at in-situ burn is because typically it has a much higher uh, recovery rate than other mechanical methods. So it's really a, an attractive uh, recovery method for us pending the results of these, these other burns. Um, our geographic response strategies is another huge improvement area. Our area contingency plan, if you've ever read it, uh, is really a strategic level a plan that is it's a framework. It's, it's, it's it's how we oversee the spill management, basically. But when you're talking about a tactical response plan, you need to get into geographic response strategies. And those are much more tactical level plans. And we've got a couple areas of consideration where we're working on them. The St. Mary's River, uh, we're developing a GRS for the St. Mary's. We actually have one. We're going to clean it up a little bit. Um, we had a draft for the Straits of Mackinac, so we're, we're working on that one. Our GRS subcommittee is working on those. And then 
uh, the next thing I mentioned earlier in the presentation, the US-2 corridor, um, that, again, that's that 90-mile stretch that runs between St. Ignace and roughly Manistique uh, underneath those 12 water crossings. This is a, a, a area of consideration for us. We're looking at this closely. The EPA briefed it uh, the other day at our last area committee meeting because, uh, again, technically it's in the inland zone, but, again, it crosses about 12 water crossings, which would lead it into Lake Michigan, so we both have a vested interest in this. Um, so we're going to continue to pursue uh, development of a GRS for the US-2 corridor. Um, that pipeline is a little more concerning in that section because it's just your normal quarter-inch seamed pipeline subject to washouts, subject to strikes from backhoes, things of that nature. So paying a lot of attention to that US-2 corridor. We also have uh, much more robust incident management teams than what we had in the past. We've done a lot of ICS training, uh, maintaining qualified teams. Um, and in, in addition to robust incident management teams, we've really plussed up our, our GO kits, our ICS GO kits, uh, which are used particularly um, important during the emergent phase of, of a situation um, where we can quickly mobilize, uh, grab our GO kits, load them in our trailers, get to the spill site, um, stand up our incident command post, and begin to uh, oversee uh, the uh, spill response as more personnel and equipment cascades in. And then um, drills, just the IMT drills that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we're holding those twice a year now, primarily focus on those ship groundings. Like I said, we average about five a year. Um, but it's the same protocol, same procedures we would use for any type of incident. And again, the focus there is on the emergent phase um, of the incident, trying to get there as quickly as possible and then uh, tying in with our local emergency managers and working on that uh, ICP, Incident Command Post, and uh, Emergency Operations Center interface. We've gotten much, much better in all of those areas. Next slide, please. So where, where the challenges still remain, uh, adverse weather. As I mentioned, uh, a third drill in the Straits would, would, would be great at some point if, uh, if, it ever, if all the stars align and we can get another one. Uh, we learned a lot of lessons there, and I think there's still work that we can, uh, things that we can learn there, which would be great. Our geographic distances, I showed you a slide right in the beginning of how big sector Sault Ste. Marie's AOR is. Uh, it can take us a while to mobilize and get to those locations, and I talk about the US-2 corridor. And again, if, if you're familiar with the Upper Peninsula, um, we're talking along places like Moran and Engadine and Brevoort, places like that where we don't have a lot of infrastructure. We don't have hotels, for example. We don't have Wi-Fi. We don't have staging areas. We don't have uh, boat launches. Um, all those things are available in the Straits of Mackinac and in the St. Mary's River. However, they're very limited uh, along that US-2 corridor. So. Um, those geographic di distances and the logistics of a response in that area are, is, is still a remaining challenge. Manpower and staffing, we, we get uh, uh, new Coast Guard members, active duty members that roll in every you know three or four years and then they rotate out. That's always a challenge for us. We get them trained up on, on ICS in a, in a specific position, for example, and then for, unfortunately they leave. They go to another location. So that's a, a continuing struggle for us. So we have to get constantly be working on our ICS and, and, our, and our incident management teams, making sure that uh, everybody's trained up and ready to go. And then sinking and weathered uh, products. Again, uh, this is, I don't want to steal Bill's thunder for his presentation, but there's still a lot of science here um, to be discovered, and uh, we're working diligently to try to understand these more. And once again, another plug for the area committee, why we're investing so heavily in academia's participation in our area committees. Um, so you can bring the subject matter expertise to the table. And then, of course, shrinking exercise budgets is, is still a concern. I think that's a concern of every, every agency out there. Um, it's primarily a problem for us because we have other emerging threats on the horizon, such as cyber, maritime active shooter, continuity of operations, uh, and the Arctic are all, um, all competing for, for a limited amount of money. Um, so our, our exercise budgets continue to shrink, and, and that's, that's problematic for us. And then finally, like I said, exercise fatigue, depending uh, where we hold those exercises, we can overstress a certain area, and we have to be cognizant of that. And we also have to keep moving throughout the AOR so we can address all those modes of transportation. Next slide, please. So here's a big question, are we ready? Um, I put on there that no plan survives first contact with the enemy, kind of a famous quote. Um, and I, I believe that's true. As I said, the Air Contingency Plan is a framework. Um, and it's not going to be able to address uh, every scenario. You can't anticipate every scenario, 
and a plan obviously can't uh, can't cover every scenario because you just don't know what's going to happen. But this is where the experience and training of our personnel come into play. Um, that gives us what I call rigid flexibility to address any situation. I always say that over time, exercises should yield observable improvements in preparedness. Do I do I believe that we've been getting better over the last nine, ten years? Uh, absolutely. From where we were ten years ago when I came on board, um, where we didn't have any, we didn't even have any ISS equipment uh, pre-stage, nothing in our, our go kits, no contingency equipment. Um, have we gotten better? Absolutely. Um, could I say that's a result of what came out of the Kalamazoo spill? I would say yes. I think that 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 pushed the ball forward for sure, as unfortunate as that was, I think. And maybe one of the good things that come out of that is uh, greater preparedness uh, on our side. Um, and then the April 2018 Straits of Mackinac anchor strike that occurred up here where uh, ATC power lines were severed and about 800 gallons of dielectric fluid spilled into the Straits of Mackinac. I think that was our first real test to see if we were capable of responding to a real-world incident. Um, our incident management team is actually designed to um, be self-sufficient for the first 48 hours as more resources and personnel cascade in, and that turned into a 38-day evolution for an 800-gallon spill. But that was a very good uh, exercise in testing our team's ability and testing our, our ability to create incident action plans and run a command post. And I, I think overall, because we surged in so many subject matter expert, expertise or experts from our other federal, state, local, tribal. Uh, academia partners ruled in that we've been working with on the exercises that we're able to stand up a very robust and efficient uh, unified command. And then my final line right there, I said, well, what if worms have machine guns with birds and mess with them? Um, I, I like that line because basically what I'm saying is I mentioned earlier about the worst case discharge numbers and how they vary so, so much. In some cases, you'll see some agencies will say a million gallons and then the uh, um, uh, FIMSA comes out and puts an airplane 189,000 gallons. So, like, why the giant delta between the two, and where's the Coast Guard's number in that? Um, we are bound by the CFR um, for our numbers, and how we calculate that number, like I said, is that total loss of product between those EFRDs, which are emergency flow restrictor devices, um, for those two 20-inch lines, 10-minute detection, three-minute shutdown. That's exactly where our number comes from. And our number varies a little bit from PHMSA's. What we have in our air contingency plan is uh, 279,636 gallons as opposed to their 189,000 gallons, but far shy of some other models that you've seen. But again, we are bound by the CFR, and that's where our number comes from for the worst case discharge in the Straits. And then finally, and <clears throat> probably the biggest force multiplier of all about are we ready or not, this is, this is kind of a shout out, um, is our team. And we have a lot of experts down at our district advisory response team led by Jerry Popeil, real smart people. Um, we have fabulous Osros like Bill Hazel, Mike Popa, and Ed Radicki, which have been working with us year after year after year in our drills, and we appreciate their support. And then you have like your NOAA scientific support coordinator, which is invaluable to us, and our, our EAGLE partners, DNR partners, et cetera. Um, I think the teams that we developed over the years because of our exercises is what makes a difference. Uh, those relationships we've built, and again, the, the, probably the, the new relationship with academia and, uh, um, you know, just a huge for, force multiplier for us bringing academia into our uh, area, contingent, or area committee um, and getting, making you part of the team. So if we have a, a large incident, then you're going to be right there in one of those seats. So when you, when you couple all those things together, I'd say 100% uh, Coast Guard is, is ready to respond w without a doubt. Um, and again, that's the reason we do those exercises to make us more prepared. So uh, I think we're actually spot on about 45 minutes for the presentation, and that's all I've got for today, and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thanks so much, Steve. Uh, this is Mark Breederland again. I, I need to introduce uh, Geneva Langland and our Michigan Sea Grant Communications team who've been uh, just awesome at uh, running, the, running the switchboard here. So Geneva's gonna handle some questions and answers. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mark, and thank you, Steve, for an awesome presentation. Uh, we've got a couple of questions from our participants. Um, first of all, what spill response drills have occurred in the Lake Superior Basin? Um, like I said, what we're focusing on actual drills in Lake Superior, well, um, hmm. <laughs> 
the, oh, I'm sorry. I, I lost my train of thought. What we're working on right now is with MSU Duluth. Uh, they are building their exercise right now. Their current cycle is a four-year cycle focused on a, uh, uh, a tanker. You know, ta yes, a tanker running aground off of Isle Royal. And um, as I said, MSU technically falls under Secretary Sault Ste. Marie's purview. They have their own planner out there. However, we've been working closely with that planner, helping them develop that exercise. So for the next four years, MSU Duluth will be focused on uh, what we call the crawl, walk, run cycle, starting with a workshop to a tabletop to a full-scale exercise building up out there in Isle Royal, uh, simulating a, um, uh, a, like a 3.2 million gallon spill is what those tankers carry as they transit through there on the way to Thunder Bay. That's the exercise we're going to be focused on in Lake Superior. Great, thanks. Um, so we know that Line 5 and other pipelines cross over some um, tribe lands that are held under different treaties. How do spill response trainings work with the tribes or do they work with the tribes? Yeah, spill response training, um, like I said, we, you know, we have um, many tribal members that are members of our area committee and we always advertise all of our ICS training uh, is advertised and of course uh, we have a lot of tribal members that participate in and take advantage of that opportunity. And then um, they're always invited uh, to participate in the exercises which they do. Um, over the years, that relationship has gotten stronger and stronger and we appreciate that. Um, mainly our, our tribes are focused on NARDA and uh, getting involved in um, the environmental unit is where we use them uh, most frequently. But uh, yes, they are absolutely incorporated into all of our ICS training and all of our exercises. And I think the Straits of Mackinac response illustrated that as well. We had uh, several members of the tribes represented in the Unified Command in the Straits of Mackinac, as they would be in a real world situation, should another one occur. Great, thank you. Um, here's another question. So a tanker spill is different than a, a Line 5 or a different pipeline oil spill. Is there any explicit pipeline spill response training for the Lake Superior Basin? Yeah, I'm, again, most of that's being done through MSU Duluth. Um, if someone has, uh, I have my contact information out there, I believe it was posted on that first slide, I can certainly uh, dial you in with the MSU planners in Duluth and get you involved in all of their training opportunities. Um, again, they're right now they're covering most of the Lake Superior uh, training and exercises, but yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Great, thank you. Um, I will, I'll continue to invite people to use the Q&A box to submit any questions that they have. Uh, here's a couple from me. I was intrigued by the idea of using peat moss and oranges as a sample material for spill response. Do you know how those two materials came to be used for training exercises like this? Yeah, I was, yeah, I was involved in that. Yeah, um, <laughs> you kind of ask around what are good oil surrogates and oranges obviously float. Um, even if they freeze, they float. They're a good product. They're easy to see in the water. Um, and they, they simulated uh, the product well, like when I said when we were doing uh, the U configurations and the J configurations and we were using the, the tugboats to, tire, to, to tow the, the fire boom. It was easy to see the oranges, um, so that was helpful. The peat moss worked well because the skimmers can actually pick it up. Uh, it floats out there in the water and the skimmers can actually pick up that product, that, that peat moss. And of course, they're biodegradable, they're not going to hurt the environment, and they were pre-approved by, at the time, the DEQ and um, uh, did the approval process for that. So it was kind of on their list of stuff that we could use, and, and it works well. I love that. Those are such fun mental images to imagine you guys chasing peat moss and oranges around in frigid waters. Well, and there's other lessons learned. One year we tried uh, Cheerios and the seagulls ate it. So... Uh, you got to be careful what you use. Yeah, that's not a, a factor you think you'd have to calculate into your training, what the seagulls do when they get hungry. Um, so maybe on a, a similar note, you talked about lessons learned that um, kind of affect your operational readiness. You talked about lessons learned that you may not be able to enact right away. What were some surprising lessons that you learned from some of these training exercises? Well, like I said, I think I think the oil and ice ones were really eye openers for us. We knew it was going to be more challenging, and I, and I think going in, a lot of us weren't even sure the equipment was going to work at all. So I think we were uh, happily surprised that that a lot of the equipment did work well. Um, and again, it was a re I, I'd obviously much rather do this in an exercise environment in advance to figure out what's going to work uh, in advance and what won't work in advance. 
Um, like I said, a lot of those skimmers uh, had difficulty operating because they just simply weren't robust enough. But there were workarounds, and I think it's kind of kind of cool, kind of neat, because um, the Osros in particular go back to the drawing board and they go, how can we make this a better product? And uh, and they've done a lot of work on that. I like the oil cages, the cages that uh, I think MPC designed that goes around their skimmers to keep ice out, um, and uh, steam lines that were attached to keep the you know the other skimmers functional so they didn't freeze up overnight. Um, and just strange things you wouldn't think to ever consider if you didn't test in advance. The aerostat, for example, we could not launch it the first day. It wouldn't go airborne, and no one could understand why. And then we actually found out is where it was positioned on the barge. Uh, the wind was coming up over the, the, the top of the barge, and it was forcing the aerostat back down. So hmm. the, the simple fix was moving it to a different location on the barge, and it went up just fine. But if you don't practice things in advance, uh, obviously, you know, you're going to find out the hard way. So, um, yeah, just in, in the AUVs and the ROVs, uh, uh, same thing. We had, we, we actually, one of them sank. It uh, sank and took us about nine hours to find it. Uh, but we did recover it. But that was another lesson learned about making sure that it was capable to operate um, in that cold environment. Uh, and I don't think where it came from had been tested in those to, the, to those extremes. So again, um, and how effective they were, the R- ROVs and the AUVs. I, I just have a just the future for those things is is unbelievable. Um, and they're such a, a huge force multiplier for us. And uh, I mean, you, you talk about the the where is oil spill recovery going to go? It's all going to be about technology and science, about the ability to find and track the submerged oils or oil and ice. Um, that is really, really an important piece that we're working on right now. And uh, I think, you know, that's, it's going to rule the future. Definitely. And obviously every training exercise is different, especially given uh, which type of transport you're working with or which region. But do you have a sense of how many different groups or organizations are involved in the average training simulation? You know, like that one we did in the Straits of Mackinac in 2015, uh, like I said, we had around 700 plus participants. And I think when it was all said and done, I think we had somewhere 70 plus different agencies were represented in some form or fashion. Um, it, wow. it's, it's really remarkable uh, how many different agencies from even from your local sheriff's department, you know, that, you know, that are working in the EOC or your fire departments or, you know, like I said, the bigger agencies that you would assume like Eagle and the DNR and the EPA and NOAA and the Coast Guard and, you know, just uh, and the Osros, of course, and just on and on and on. It's it's and, and the tug operators and the AUV operators and the drone operators. And it's just amazing. Uh, how many people have a vested interest and how many stakeholders there are, again, which it's so important to do these exercises to find out what everybody brings to the table. Yeah, these sound like incredible undertakings and impressive that you've been able to do so many of them. Um, We've got a couple more questions coming through online. And again, I'll invite anyone who has a question to submit it through the Q&A box. Um, Do you have access to data from the Newfoundland offshore oil experiment? Um, It's an older experiment, but it might provide some data on air column pollutant emissions. No, but I'd I'd love to see it if somebody's got it. Okay, so it sounds like we've got somebody who might be able to reach out to Stephen with some uh, new new leads here. Yeah, and absolutely. I will get that in the hands of our district response advisory team guys down there in Cleveland uh, to, to review. Um, yeah, absolutely. hundred percent. Great. I am going to then flip back to the slide where we have your contact information. So the uh, participant who asked this question can get in touch with you. Thank you. Um, here's another one. How have any exercises uh, looked at delineating the spread of oil beneath an unbroken cover of ice? N- not to my knowledge. I don't know about that. And again, um, Bill's going to be on, I think, what you got in a couple of weeks, Bill Hazel, and he might be the right guy. He could probably tell you about that, not, not to my knowledge. knowledge. Um, does, I don't, are we talking about use of dispersants under the ice? Is that what we're talking about? Um, it actually sounded more like a modeling question about how to, how to predict the spread, maybe, of oil under the ice and how you'd respond to it. I I don't know. Again, um, I'm thinking the right guy would be Grant Gunn on that. I think that's the work they're doing Mm -hmm. uh, in Michigan State, um, and that might be the right person to find out from. I'm not familiar with it, uh, 
but again, this is this is new to us, and this is where we're going right now. But uh, so I'm not familiar with it. Um, right. But I'm, might, I'm sure there's lots of lots of opportunities for uh, grants to fund computer modelers to put together simulations just like that. Yeah, between Guy Meadows and, and Grant Gunn, I'm sure there's there's two people there that would are, are the right people. Great. Um, how much oil in ice recovery technology or uh, t techniques for recovering oil from ice are being shared with other regional coast guards, such as Alaska or other countries that might deal with similar challenges like Canada or Russia? Yeah, all these things get posted out there, you know, shared to the Coast Guard network um, of best practices uh, that get shared by our, uh, like I said, I mentioned before, throughout our CPS system. So everybody's aware of best practices amongst the Coast Guard of what's going on. So the word does get out there. So there's cross pollination that way. Great. We've got just a couple more minutes for questions. If anybody has a, a lingering question they'd like to ask, feel free to submit it through the Q&A box. So you mentioned that emerging technology and developing technology will be a pretty exciting frontier in the next five, 10 years. Is there a particular piece or type of technology that you are particularly excited about? Well, obviously, again, I think it's that, it's that, it's that oil and ice uh, scenario, which is concerning for us, like I said, because finding the product. Uh, if it doesn't present itself in a hole in the ice, I mean, you know, there's, it's, it's very rare to have complete ice coverage in the Straits of Mackinac. I mean, you, you have a combination of soft and hard water, obviously, but the stuff that is under the ice and discovering where it is, to me, that's, that's the biggest challenge. And, um, so yeah, trying to find that 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 oil, either if it's embedded itself in the ice or if it's sinking in the water column or if, or if it actually sinks, where did it go, and how can we track it and figure out where it's going to go next and how can we how can we uh, recover it? And we're probably talking pretty uh, pretty great depths in the Straits of Mackinac, obviously. So that technology obviously is very exciting to us because you know that's the piece we want to have the answer to. This is a question that might betray my ignorance a little bit about crude oil transport and spill response, but how much of the oil that gets recovered is usable, could be put back into the system and processed and used by consumers? Well, it's going to be, you know, <laughs> mixed with the water when it's recovered. Um, uh, of course, it's separated out, and, and, and that's a great, another good question, I think. I'm writing these down for Bill Hazel, because I, again, <laughs> I hope he's fine. I call Bill the mad scientist, and uh, he's an absolute genius. Um, he's an OSRO, an oil spill removal organization, um, so he may actually know or Mike Popa might know, and I can get you the answer, but I honestly don't know if they do reuse it, but that, that's a great question. Um, I don't know, but I, I can find out. Yeah, I'm just curious about that one. I, I am too. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions coming through the Q&A box right now. We've got just a minute or two before three o'clock, but if nobody else has anything they'd like to submit, then we can wrap up a couple minutes early. So I'd like to thank Mark for guiding us into this talk and Stephen for all of your excellent information and insights that you've given into this subject. Um, if anybody has any more questions, uh, Steve's contact information is up on the slide right now, or you can get in touch with the Great Lakes uh, St. Lawrence Crude Oil Transport Group. We will be posting a captioned video of this webinar on the website uh, within the next, hopefully within the next week. So keep an eye out for that. And if you're on the crude oil list serve, you'll get a notification uh, from, from me when the video is ready. And thank you, Geneva. Thanks, Steve, for a great talk. And uh, look forward to uh, August 19th at the same time with uh, Bill Hazel, Vice President of Marine Services for Marine Pollution Control Incorporated. So thanks great. again and have a great afternoon. I'm actually going to pop in with one more note that came through from a participant. Um, they said, um, in terms of wondering how technology gets shared among different groups who do oil spill response, the Emergency Prevention, Preparedness, and Response Working Group of the Arctic Council does share information on technology and research and development for Arctic areas. And the U.S. is a member of this Arctic Council and the working group. So it sounds like there's a good 
robust network for passing this information around different nations that might be able to use it. All right, and with Thanks that, again. call it good. Thank you very much, everyone.